Hello, my friends. Welcome to me, your host, Christian Watson. So, my friends, I'm sure many of you have heard by now, if not, I'll question if you're living under a rock or not, that um, the verdict for the George Floyd, Derek Chauvin, excuse me, the, the Derek Chauvin trial, which was concerned with the murder of George Floyd, has just come in. Well, it came in a few hours ago, but by the time I have made this video, it'll be a day or so later. And, of course, the jury said that Derek Chauvin was guilty. Now, look, my friends, it is not my duty, nor is it my interest, to give you a cons a, a, a elaborate legal analysis of the ins and outs of the George Floyd trial and why I think Chauvin is guilty or not guilty. That's what many of what I call the everyday pundits want to do. That's not my goal. My mission is very simple, and I say it almost at every single one of my videos. My mission is to connect the human with the political and the political with the human. All that means is connecting how we value and view things in our personal lives to how politics operates and how our individual interaction with politics translates into something bigger on a grand scale. Because unfortunately, my friends, that is how modern-day politics is to be understood. That is not how it is meant to be, at least not in the Anglo-American sense. The Anglo-American sense of politics was simply meant to be a safeguard against the tyranny of society against the individual, but unfortunately, the Anglo-American experiment of politics is now being utilized at a on the basis for the tyranny of society against the individual. There has been an inversion, and I will explain how that inversion happened in a few moments. Because, my friends, this wasn't simply a murder trial. This was an exhibition of just how deeply personal and subjective our politics has become. Derek Chauvin, to the activists that had been... Um, who have been praising this verdict, and I'm not saying them praising their verdict is bad, but the way they praise the verdict have been praised been pretty poor. These activists, Derek Chauvin is not a man who made an egregious decision that led to the death of someone else. No, no, no. Derek Chauvin is the avatar, the mascot of every single action of white supremacy, every single conceptual um, formation of white supremacy in American society. You don't believe me? Well, let's see what some of the biggest organizations on the left who embody and provide infrastructure to the activist mentality have been saying. The national NAACP said this exactly. It, it says that uh, after the, the Stoven trial, it says that while justice landed Derek Chauvin behind bars for murdering George Floyd, no amount of justice will bring back Gianna's father. The same way a reasonable police officer would never suffocate an unarmed man to death, the, a reasonable justice system would recognize its roots in white supremacy and end qualified immunity. So right there you see a conflation of two different things. Qualified immunity is simply the act of the government shielding itself from civil liability, in my opinion, it needs to be streamlined and ended, but that has nothing to do inherently with white supremacy. You see, because Chauvin is white, they are using this excuse to say that this individual action translates into a very broad system of, of white supremacy. So they do a false conflation, a false equivalency, which is a logical fallacy. Then they make a hefty statement without actually proving it. And they do it by proximity, by association. Uh, Chauvin is white. Ergo, uh, he must be a white supremacist due to, because he did, he did a action that was wrong to a black man. They don't see Chauvin as an individual. Oh, you don't? Do you think I'm just using one example? All right. Well, let's look at, at what um, Black Lives Matter, the Global Foundation Network. This is the Black Lives Matter Inc., which was founded by the three women and one of them who just got a million dollar mansion. It said this. We hope this guilty verdict begins to show that white supremacy will not win. White supremacy has no place in democracy, especially one that is supposed to guarantee our freedom to live. So once again, Chauvin the individual is no longer the individual. It's Chauvin the white supremacist. And none of these people have established that he actually holds white supremacist views. It is his actions in proximity to the composition, the physiology of his being, which give these people a fallacious way to claim that he is a white supremacist and that this, and that this action was a product of white supremacy. No evidence, no logical constructions, no philosophical honesty, just guilt by association and false equivalency. Kamala Harris said this trial will not heal the pain that has existed for generations. Tying this single trial to an alleged history of racial oppression 
that black people, according to Kamala Harris, and people in her racially bound ideology still think is occurring. This verdict is but a piece of it, she said, and it will not heal the pain that has existed for generations, that has existed for generations amongst people who have experienced and firsthand witnessed what a broader public is seeing. Again, she is tying this entirely back to the idea of a race. To the idea of race. It's something else to talk about police brutality, which is an issue, in my opinion, that needs to be discussed. It needs to be dealt with in an honest way. It's another thing to proclaim that race is the primary factor of all interactions that relate to police and black people. See, what this mentality reflects, the just primacy of symbolism in American politics, right? I heard Stu over at Blaze TV say, well, individualism is being lost. Well, Stu, I agree with you. Individualism, individualism is being lost. But why is that? We can, we can diagnose the problem, but if I don't tell you the foundational reason as to why individualism is being lost, then I'm not really giving us anything that we can work with. When I say the symbolic nature of American politics, I'm saying that people, and this goes back to the human values thing that I mentioned, our personal subjective values being merged with the political processes and therefore and being able to enshrine those personal subjective values onto other people through the levers of the political process. This is what Frederick Bastiat, the great political theorist over in France, would say. He would call that when political interests, public interests become bigger. Yeah, private interests become public interests, excuse me. So... We tend to understand politics through symbols. What is the American flag? Well, it stands for freedom. What is the sort of the, 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 the black fist stand for? You know, fight against injustice. You know, what does George Floyd stand for? Well, he stands for apparently, according to these people, um, the uh, the ongoing oppression of black folks in the country. What does Derek Chauvin stand for? Well, apparently, he stands for the the systemic white supremacy that allegedly exists in the country. But the problem is, my friends, symbols are limited in the amount of a message that they can convey. The American flag can convey the word freedom, but what is freedom? What does it mean? How does it interact? Is it a physiological component of my being or is it something that is given to me? Is it structural? What is it? Um, when does my freedom interact with someone else and when does their freedom end with my freedom? And these are questions that have been taken up by philosophy and these are questions that have answers. But my point is this, if we simply suck to a symbolic understanding of politics, we would simply be left with nifty adages that tell us nothing substantial about the concepts that we use and to make judgments and the concepts that we use to propagate our systems. The American system is predicated upon, as the brilliant political philosopher Frank Meyer said, an organic moral order. But Meyer also notes that so many people who believe in tradition, and solely tradition, will pretend that customs only matter, and they will actually ignore the tradition of the organic moral order. And he also mentions that so many people who are against tradition don't recognize that their... Um, uh, adherence to freedom comes from the tradition of that organic moral order. Of course, Meyer was talking about the debate between libertarians and more conservatives, and he was trying to bridge the gap to say, hey, we're one and the same. So, but there's a symbolic purpose in all of that, my friends. We look at symbols, and we use symbols to make judgments. What do you think memes are? Memes are simply symbols, co symbols condensed into comedic form, typically. And comedy itself becomes a mode of political action. But the problem of using symbols, as I mentioned before, is that it simplifies things. Hannah Arendt, the great political theorist of the 20th century, who I don't agree with on everything, but she said that it is, there is a danger in creating a fictitious world where a single value is used to explain everything. For the activists on, on, on Twitter and elsewhere... You know, hearing someone like Van Jones say, let's make sure that we can have a unified front on this issue that both sides are understood, that makes them upset. Why do you think it makes them upset? It makes them upset because they want to explain everything in America, especially surrounding the topic of race, through a uni-causal, uni-singular way. They don't want to admit or even entertain the possibility 
that there could be more possibilities and more perspectives on the issue of race, on the issue of being a certain thing in America, on the issue of marginalization, on the issue of intersectionality, on the issue of anything, they don't want to admit there could be other perspectives because to them, in their unicausal, unisingular worldview, other perspectives are correlated and are, and, and are simply endemic to evil. These are perspectives that are against the livelihoods of black people, many of them would say. Or they would even call them racist perspectives. Delgado and Stefanik, the two people, two men who help cultivate critical race theory, they said in their seminal book, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, they said that, 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 that whiteness and white, the white elite and the white working class are the two um, factions of society which try to maintain racism because it benefits them. Those are their exact words. Look it up. They don't want to possibly explain or have entertain the idea that their phraseology could be wrong, their conception of white folks could be wrong, their conception of classes could be wrong, because guess what? All that is a part of the power structure of maintaining racism. When you have the kind of uh, reductionist mentality that so many activists have about this trial, this trial is nothing more than another battle in the culture war. This trial is nothing more than another rung in the ladder of fighting racism. That's a dangerous perspective, my friends. George Floyd and Derek Chauvin are being weaponized for narrow political purposes, which is why you still have people saying that the guilty verdict is not enough. You still have incensed minds saying that we're going to keep marching, we're going to keep fighting because the guilty verdict is not enough. Because this was not a man who was tragically killed because an officer derelicted his duty. No, no, no. This was a man who represents the fate of black people in the country and a man who represents the zenith of white supremacy in the country. These two concepts are clashing and that's what we saw manifest according to these people. And so long as we view the world in such a rigid dialectic of oppression and conflict, so long we will forego our ability to actually effect change in a way that adheres to the facts of the matter. We will get away from the pursuit of objective truth. We will get away from, from breaking from our prison of simply seeing politics as an array of symbols rather than an elaborate statement of many different values collaborating towards a particular aim or multiple aims. We will miss the true nature of ourselves, our processes, and our world. And we will forgo our ability to escape from falsehood. My friends, if we're going to have a discussion about these things, we have to follow the advice of the great John Stuart Mill. And he said that your experience is not enough. You have to have discourse when you talk about ideas to make sure that your experience escapes from error. Are you escaping from error, my friends? Because I know the leftists that are currently ranting and raving about this not being over, and this being an example of white supremacy, they are living in error, and they are wallowing in it, and they are wallowing it gleefully. Never do that, regardless of your political orientation. Think on it. As always, my friends, I love you, and please, if you want to support me, um, donate on Patreon, patreon.com slash officialcwatson. But until next time, my friends, I love you, and please stay pensive. Bye-bye.